Hey everyone, welcome back. Around 14 years ago now, Intel launched the Core 2 Duo E7000 series. Now, these were direct replacements for the E4000 series which launched a year beforehand. The first of these CPUs came in April 2008 with the Core 2 Duo E7200, followed up in August of that same year with the one we're going to be looking at today, the, e the Core 2 Duo E7300. If that will focus. Now, uh, I actually managed to get this E7300 for only £1.99 here in the UK, which is roughly just under three US dollars, um, there are, thereabouts. Before we carry on and have a look at the specs of the E7300 though, I just wanted to say that from this video onwards for like older CPUs like this in particular, um, I've decided to go back to using Windows 7 for testing instead of Windows 10. I am planning on doing a video on this um, at, at some point in the future, maybe not the next video, or maybe the next video, depends on um, what I want to do when I get around to doing another one. Um, I am going to be doing a Windows 7 versus Windows 10 sort of gaming performance video for CPUs like this, because when I initially upgraded the benchmarking system to Windows 10, I did notice that performance, particularly in like Grand Theft Auto 5, was a lot worse compared to what it was in Windows 7. Um, a lot of texture popping and things like that. So yeah, um, for this video I am going back to Windows 7 for testing this. But that aside, let's go over some of the specs for the E7300 before we get on for the benchmarks. Launched at a price of 133 US dollars back on August 10th, 2008 which is around 171 US dollars today, adjusting for inflation. The Core 2 Duo E7300, a dual-core processor running at 2.67 GHz, was based on the Wolfdale 3M architecture, 3M being a reference to the 3 MB of L2 cache that got shared between both of the two cores. This is actually cut down from the full Wolfdale architecture that the E8000 series uses, which has 6 MB of L2 cache instead. There is no hyper-threading, so that wasn't really a thing yet, but we do have support for DDR1, DDR2 and DDR3 RAM as well, which is a wide range of RAM support that you just won't see nowadays. It would be like Intel's latest 12th generation of CPUs still supporting DDR3 to put it into perspective. They actually use DDR5 now. There are more detailed specs on screen for anyone that wants them, and the specs of the test system are in the description down below. But for now, let's jump into the benchmarks and see just how useful the E7300 is in some older games, and some slightly more modern ones too. First up is Cinebench R20. This one is quite useful for gauging relative performance between processors using all of the cores a processor has. It's not actually that representative of real world performance, as the rendering software that it is based on really isn't that widely used, although it is a benchmark I do quite like running. But the way it works is that it splits up an image into tiles, and assigns a tile to each available core for that core to render. The faster it makes up the image, the higher the score, and the higher the score the better. Older CPUs like this can take ages to render the image, and there are scores on the left hand side to compare this to, but E7300 at stock speeds managed to score 311 points, and did this while pulling around only 22.73 watts. This power figure is a good gauge for how much power the CPU needs at full load. It's not practical for me to measure power draw in games, as the meter that I use doesn't actually log power draw over time. First up for the games today is 2018's The Adventure Pals by indie devs Massive Monster. I quite like including this game as it runs on pretty much anything and also raises awareness of what I'd definitely call a hidden gem. You find that a lot with indie titles because they just don't get the coverage that AAA titles do. That aside, the E7300 runs it almost perfectly. There are very minor, near unnoticeable stutters at points throughout, which don't affect gameplay at all, but otherwise there are no other issues. This game did make me realise though that I had to disable all power saving options in the BIOS for the tests, as the game puts such little load on the CPU that the clock speed kept dropping, causing noticeable stutters at points. This drop in clocks was then fixed by disabling the power saving options. 
CSGO is next up, a game that had its initial release back in 2012, but has since become more intensive to run hardware-wise nowadays. This isn't a game I play myself, to be perfectly honest, but it is still amongst the most popular games today in terms of how many people play it. I'm running the test in the Mirage map against bots to make the benchmarks more reliable, as I've found this to give more realistic benchmark figures than the benchmark itself that's available on Steam, I think. There was noticeable stuttering for the most part, although it wasn't bad enough to ruin gameplay, but you are definitely going to see it, especially in the most intense scenes with everyone on screen at once, and perhaps when maybe there's smoke as well, although I'm not quite sure on that one. In these most intense scenes, FPS can actually dip below 30. It is usually between the mid-40s into the 60s, but the stutter means it isn't actually smooth at any point at all. GTA V is the most recent game in the tests today, or at least the most recent AAA game, as the Adventure Pals is three years younger. And with the E7300, while GTA V is technically playable, it doesn't exactly perform well either. Driving throughout the city can be quite stuttery, with FPS dipping as low as the low 20s at several points throughout. This lifts to around 30 FPS at best during the daytime, but still regularly dips to around the low 20s. There are also chances that some of the road textures won't render either, as happened on one occasion during this test. Stuttering on the highway heading out towards the desert area is far less, but still noticeable, with performance in the desert area itself much the same as it is in the city. I even had a few occasions where keyboard inputs wouldn't register at all. Nothing severe, but bad enough for me to notice it, even if only momentarily. Lastly, before we move on to see what the E7300 can do with an overclock, it's Skyrim, a game that, despite having over 70 hours in, I haven't actually played before. All of those hours are from benchmarking this with previous CPUs and graphics cards. I wasn't expecting this to perform that well, but to my surprise, it was actually quite playable. Performance generally was quite smooth, although there could be minor stuttering and hitches at points throughout mainly on the run through the woods towards Riverwood, near the start of the game, and when going into the village itself. Heading up towards Bleak Falls Temple can cause a few minor hitches but nothing much else, and inside the temple itself you'll only ever see a few minor stutters and hitches too. The majority of the stuttering and hitches seem to be near or within the more densely populated areas such as Riverwood. And for those of you that understand the benchmark figures on the left, performance definitely wasn't as bad as it might suggest, at least not to my eyes anyway. So now it's time to do some overclocking. And for anyone familiar with older processors like the Core 2 Duos, etc., you'll also know how much they can overclock. I won't go into the detailed settings for the overclock I achieved, but I'll put them on the screen over there right now. But for my particular E7300, I managed to get 3.7 GHz out of it, a whole 1 GHz over the standard speed. And because of how overclocking these CPUs worked, it also increases the speed of the RAM as well, which is on screen now. So with those clocks in mind, let's jump back into the benchmarks, with Cinebench up first again. Cinebench saw a pretty big increase in score. Pre-overclock, we saw a score of 311 points. This was the average of two runs of the benchmark. Doing the same for the 3.7 GHz overclock, the E7300 managed 435.5 points on average. This is a massive 40.03% higher score than stock, although power draw has now jumped pretty significantly. 46.75 watts might not seem much, but relative to the pre-overclock power draw, that is a jump of 104.77%, for only a 40% increase in score, showing just how inefficient the E7300 becomes once you start to push it. Back into the games now, and the Adventure Pals sees no visible change at all. Possibly the stutter is fractionally better, but that might just be a placebo. There were a few less hitches, which explain the higher benchmark figures, but other than that, there's no difference to pre overclocked performance. 2012 CSGO sees a pretty significant improvement. The stuttering was only very slightly noticeable now throughout the match, and was mainly only noticeable when turning the camera around. But even then, it wasn't that bad at all. 
there were still a few noticeable hitches at points, and one occasion where there was pretty noticeable stuttering, but only for a brief moment. Overall though, the improvement is huge. GTA 5 was kind of weird, as it seemed, to my eye at least, to perform worse than it did the pre-overclock. The benchmark figures are higher, suggesting at least slightly better performance, although what I actually saw goes against that. Performance had basically the same issues as it did pre-overclock, with severe stuttering throughout the city, both during the night and daytime, although FPS during the night was a bit lower than I remembered it being before. Performance elsewhere was basically the same pre-overclock. There might even have been hitches where there weren't any before, although saying that, I am limited in the amount of times I can run a benchmark per game to only one 30 minute run for stock clocks, and the same for an overclock, as Benchy Test is literally me doing everything rather than a team of people working on individual parts of the videos that you watch. So performance may well have turned out to be equal had I been able to do more benchmark runs. And lastly we're back to Skyrim. And much like CSGO, Skyrim performs far better with the overclock as well. The stuttering and hitches on the way to and in Riverwood itself were now far better. I mean, they weren't bad before, and it's not perfect still, but performance is noticeably better than it was pre-overclock. There were maybe a few more hitches in Bleak Falls Temple this time round, but that again could be down to me not being able to run the benchmark more times, or just not fully remembering what performance was like without the overclock. Overall though, performance was noticeably better and quite a substantial improvement. So to conclude, considering the E7 300, a processor that once cost over 100 US dollars that can now be had for less than free, is able to offer the sort of performance it can in older games. Think CSGO, Skyrim, etc. At least the original Skyrim, I'm not sure about the multiple other versions. And in lesser known indie games like the Adventure Pals, for example, you really wouldn't be wrong for buying it. Not everyone has any interest in AAA titles, so for those who are more into indie games or older AAA titles even, Core 2 Duos or Quads and AMD's older CPUs as well are definitely good shouts for a decent and cheap gaming rig. Thanks everyone for watching my little video on the Core 2 Duo E7300. Um, I want to say thanks in particular to Patreon supporters Shadow in the Void, Jimmy the Bantam and Matt Asterak. Um And thanks to all of my other patrons you'll be seeing somewhere there about now. I wanted to finish on a bit more of a serious note than um, I normally do. Basically for those of you watching who maybe know me personally, whether that be through the Jara Aaron sick. I can't pronounce that properly, um, park, community online, or through Twitter and whatnot. He's made know I've been going through counselling recently. So the counselling, it really, really has helped me. Um, I do still have work to do to get better, but um, I just wanted to talk about this uh, openly in this video because, or to end this video, because um, for all I know, there could be someone watching this right now who is really, really struggling and could really, really benefit from counselling, but is maybe too scared to do so. So in talking about this, I am hoping that I'll encourage at least one person watching this to actually get help from themselves, yeah, help for themselves. Because even though I still have work to do, it really, really has helped and it, it really, really will help you too. But yeah. If you're struggling, please get help because your future self will thank you. But yeah, um, that's going to be it for now, so see you in the next one.